come to order this morning. Glad to see everyone. Everyone here in person, everyone on Zoom. Has God been good to you? Huh? Have you come to worship him today, give him praise? for who he is and what he does and how he saved our soul. Uh, that, that, should, that should make us glad, right? He called us out of the darkness into his light, right? And sealed us with his Holy Spirit. We we're talking about in Ephesians today and the benefits we get with salvation. That's enough to make you say hallelujah right now. Hallelujah right now. Right? So I'm going to turn it over to our praise team this morning and let's let's praise the Lord with them. Let's give God a hand clap this morning, all right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. You know, Jesus told us he was going away to prepare a place for us and that he would receive us there. And that place that he's going to prepare for us is over in the glory land. So we're going to say just over in the glory land this morning. Have a home prepared where the saints abide Just over in the glory land And I long to be by my Savior's side Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land Join the happy angel band Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land There with the mighty host I'll stand Just over in the glory land I am home my way to those mansions fair just over in the glory land there to sing God's praise and his glory share just over in the glory land just over in the glory land they'll join Lord, I'll see just over in the glory land, and the kindred safe there forever be just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy age. Over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land, with the blood washed throne I will shout and sing, just over us to Christ the Lord and King just over in the glory land just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory 
mighty host I'll stand just over in the glory land. Praise the Lord.
Linda's doing double duty back there. Um, I'm here to read today's scripture. We'll be coming from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, um, beginning at verse 4. And it reads, just as he chose us um, in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him with love, having, destined, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to, uh, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us, he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to, to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who trusted, who first trusted in Christ should be praised to, to for we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guy is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Uh, I'm reading from uh first two, uh, from Ephesians chapter one, verses three through fourteen. Um please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh thank you for bringing us to the uh the house of God today, Father, through the rain, Father, which you blessed us with, Lord. We uh, we ask for your blessing on this service, Father, on, uh, on all those under the sound of my voice, Father, for those that are both in the sanctuary and uh, viewing this um, from home, Lord, all of those that, uh, that are in need of your blessing, Father, those that are um, having medical issues or sickness in their, in their family, Father, or just struggling. We ask that you uh, bless us all, Father, and allow us to... Uh, to meditate on your word and, uh, and come to a closer and better understanding of you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your blessings, Father, and we continue to uh, to praise your name, Father, in a world that maybe doesn't see it that way. Lord, we understand that you are our salvation, Father, and that you are um, you are our our our, our blessing. Lord, you blessed us in, in so many different ways, Father. Uh, we thank you for this grace, Father, and we say this prayer in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, Progressive. This is the uh, time in our service when we uh, welcome our visitors. So on behalf of uh, Brother Olson Stuckey and the First Lady Sister Kay and the entire Progressive family, we'd like to welcome our visitors. So if we have any visitors today, we welcome you if you like to stand, say your name, uh, who invited you, or raise your hand if you don't feel comfortable with standing. And, uh, so we'll give the time now to welcome our visitors. Okay. Have your visitors? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thank, thank Progressive Body for being here and uh, we'll turn it over to Progressive Church. Amen. Good morning. Okay, here are the, there are a few announcements we have for this Sunday. Uh, we don't have no specific prayer requests, but we want to continue to keep those who are sick and homebound and those who have lost loved ones in our prayers this week. The Women's Ministry Monthly Prayer Meeting will be next Sunday, March the 26th, from 6 to 7 on Zoom. The link to the meeting can be found on our church website. And our semi-annual church business meeting will be held on Saturday, April the 15th at 10 a.m. Members who would like to submit agenda items for consideration must do so no later than Sunday, March the 26th. Agenda items must be in writing and can be submitted by email to admin 
at progressiveforlife.org, or you can drop it off in the office. This concludes our announcements for this week. Amen, church. Amen. All right. Let us just give God the praise. Amen. Every opportunity we have. Go ahead. Every step I make, I'm going to make it. Every step I make, I'm going to make it in the name of Jesus. The reason why, because every yes, round goes, it gets a little higher, 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 higher. 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 Every song I sing I'm gonna sing it in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. every song I sing I'm gonna sing it yes in the name of Jesus right it gets a little higher, 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 higher. higher. Every prayer I pray, I'm going to pray it in the name of Jesus. Yes, I am. Every prayer I pray. I'm gonna pray it, yes, in the name of Jesus. The reason why, because every yes, round goes, it gets a little higher, 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 higher. 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 I'm gonna make it, gonna make it for Jesus. I'm gonna make it, gonna make it for the Lord. Every step I take, gonna make it for Jesus. I'm gonna make gonna it, gonna make it for the Lord. Hills may get high, gonna make it for Jesus. Still I'm gonna make gonna it, gonna make it for the Lord. Valleys may get low, gonna make it for Jesus. Still I got to make gonna it, gonna make it for the Lord. Well, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. Yes, I am. Every step that I take, I'm going to make in the name of Jesus. Sometimes I'm up, I'm going to make it. Sometimes I'm down, I'm going to make it. And he all right, and he all right. If you know he's all right, if you know he's all right, wave your hands, wave your hands. Let the world know beside your own. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Can I call him? Can I call him? I call him. Can I call him? Somebody call him Mary's baby. Somebody call him a rock. But I call him. I call him. Jesus. Jesus. Waymaker. Jesus. And he all right. And he all right. I'm going to make it. 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 
Because every yes, round goes. It gets a little higher, 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 higher. higher.
beside me, right? Yeah. Who signed up for that train? <laughs> I mean, that means you're going to have to move out the driver's seat yeah. and have a seat in the passenger seat. And if you've ridden with some people as passengers, you know the first thing they do when they get in the passenger seat is they start fixing the car to make their satisfactions. <laughs> they start adjusting the windshield wipers and the mirrors like they're still driving. Yeah, yeah. But thank you to the middle course for reminding us that we are supposed to be led and guided. So that means that I have to take my own pride, my own issues of wanting to be in control and move them to the side. Bring you greetings this morning, Progressive, those of us who are with us and those of us who are at home uh, or are traveling, wherever you may be out with us in Zoom. I bring you greetings um, this morning. As we continue our study in Ephesians, it is always masterful to be able to look at the work that Paul has done for the church because we are putting together a picture of something that we can't understand through what has been left behind. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1. If you're there, you can find it. Uh, you, we were the one that we had for Sunday school. And for those of you who don't, you're looking for it in Ephesians chapter 1. You can get started there. I want us to consider for this moment, what would it be like if, for example, for a rite of passage, you were chosen. You were chosen for a rite of passage. During this rite of passage, you had to go four days with no eating, no drinking, and no sleeping. After that, you were led into a great, great hall, and from there, there were, you were supposed to stand smiling while elders had pierced your flesh with uh, skewers. After being, your flesh being pierced with skewers, you would be elevated from your own flesh to the base of a ceiling. In the process, because this wasn't hard enough, they decided to tie weights to your feet while you were elevated by these skewers that were holding you up. Sounds like fun? If you survived this ordeal, you were given the grand ceremony and had your pinky removed from your hand, and you were replaced in the tribe as a superior warrior. Would you want to sign up? Ironically, you could do it twice, and upon doing it twice, you were elevated to having eternal fame in the tribe. Sounds like nothing I want to sign up for. But this is one of the tribes, this is one of the actions that a tribe in North America used to take. Pronounced, hopefully I don't mispronounce it, it would be the Mandan Okipa tribe. And that was their spirit ceremony. They held this tribe for warriors every year. And they believed that this tribe, get, this, this ritual gave them right in the heavenly realms of their tribe. I praise God that the church has had no such rituals or rites of passage that we've had to go to to receive what we have received. But Paul reminds us so evidently in, in this warm letter that he writes to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 3, he reminds us that the church is the family of God. And we are family because God has paid the price for us. Spoiler alert, we are the family of God, not by race. We are the family of God by grace. We got in there not because of bloodlines or genealogies, not because of wills or testaments, but because Christ died on the cross for our sins. And that's worth the price of admission this morning. As we see this passage of scripture and we see when Paul opens up this letter to this church that he's been with for years, he spent time with for years, he on these journeys and we go back and look at it from Acts 18 to Acts 20, you see the time that he spent in Ephesus and we realize that he had a real deep connection, not only with just one particular church, but with all these churches in this region. And as he sits down to craft this letter, it's not a matter of at the beginning getting to the point where he's going itemizing things off the list and checking them off, but he's really setting in this introduction what it means to be a family and how it takes to get into the family of God. While it's an epistle that's written to carry doctrinal issues, he really wants to get into the heart of the matter, which is, hey, we're all family. We're family of God, and we don't need strange rites or rituals to get us there. 
How does Paul say that we are in the family of God? There are three things that I'm going to look at today, and trust me, there are many more, which will be debated by many scholars and will be presented by many great preachers, far greater than I am. But the three that we're going to look at today is, one, what you don't see is what you get. We are God's family by adoption, and we are God's grace on display. One of the greatest challenges that we have, especially, is that we've got these eyes. And you know what eyes do, right? They see. If you've ever been to a dinner table, we know what eyes do, right? They see more than we can eat. If you've ever gone to any sort of great store, you know these eyes, they see more things than we can afford to buy. These eyes are responsible for racism because you can separate different groups of people based on what you see. Some are darker than others. Some are lighter than others. So some have this, some have that. All those things are encompassed in the fact because these are things that we see with our own eyes. We can see these things. We put images up in front of us and those images that we see help us find our space in this society. One of the great challenges that we have is that images of people who look like you typically are things in how people perceive you to be. That's why we can, we can a lot of times make associations. One crazy association that I'm making right now, and I shouldn't be trying to do it, is like every time you see a movie with 10 African Americans in it, what's happening in the movie? Somewhere there's drugs probably being sold. Somewhere there's this sort of navigational system that's being happened. And it's because they want us to perceive this is what groups of people who look like this do. And our eyes tell us these stories all the time, right? It's our eyes. We see these things. We want to be able to see these things. Somebody pulls up in a Lamborghini, what do we say? We say they've made it. Whatever their philosophy is, we want to listen to it. Because we see these things. And the church is no different. When we walk into buildings and spaces where people have upgraded and done all these wonderful things, we're like, ooh, this church must be doing a lot because God's really blessing them, right? According to the text, Paul says, hey, look, you ain't worried about buildings. Starting off in chapter 3, I mean, in chapter Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, said, blessed be the God and Lord of our Savior Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. I ain't got my, my, my spiritual blessings aren't all here. <laughs> if I, matter of fact, if I take an inventory of my spiritual blessings here, I'm going to come up pretty short. Praise God, I have what I have. And I don't, don't get me wrong, I've learned to be content. Right? Paul explains that we have to learn to be content. But my spiritual blessings aren't here. If anything we've learned over this past week, no matter what I've got in the bank, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank have told us that it is of absolutely no consequence to you. At any moment in time, it could disappear. Yes, and oh yes, the FDIC bailed them out and everybody who was there in them, but there may not be a space for individuals who will be bailed out. Guess what my blessings are? In a place where there is no bankruptcy policy, there is no inflation. There is principle of scarcity is not one that needs to exist because there is enough for everybody to have all that they need. Amen. And it is backed, not by the FDIC, but it is backed by the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is said to be our down payment and our inheritance. This letter that went to the Ephesians had to let them know that, hey, you are a family and don't base your things on what you see. You have a perspective that sits far above any Roman Empire, any, any government duty that you had, and it will transcend longer than when the church of Ephesus has closed its doors and the lights are turned off. All who name the name of Christ have blessings in heavenly places. Amen. Can I see them? Nope. Can I? Sure wish I could, right? Could I download some of those blessings? Could I, could I, could I sell some of my 403B in, inheritance and turn it into chicken and steak and rice? Sure would be nice. But I don't have to worry about that because if you're flying at 5,000 feet, the ground looks real close. When you're flying at $30,000 feet, it just looks like it's all flat. And all of the problems that we see in our life should all look flat. We make mountains out of them, right? But from God's perspective, it's all just little molehills that we're jumping over for us to get through. 
Name something that kept you up at night five years ago. Probably don't even remember it. Worried about it. Kept you awake at night. Now it's like, what was I even thinking about? I got tomorrow's problems to worry about because I'm looking and focused and setting my eyes on, you know, on tomorrow's problems. And really what I need to do, what Paul is saying, is take an eternal perspective. You have blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, we have an avatar in heaven at present, right now, representing us. <laughs> Sitting there. Blessings in heavenly places. But what we see is not what we're going to get. Well. And no matter what I'm, we have amassed in this life, no matter how many businesses, no matter how much real estate, no matter how much money we accumulate, well, as soon as the funeral, before the funeral is had, it's all cashed in. <laughs> And folks who may or may not have liked you will be spending whatever it was that you have saved in this life. And everything that you have saved in this life is worth nothing in the next. We have blessings in places that last eternally, so then we ought to behave as if we are taken care of eternally and not trying to grab everything that we can get in the present. We're not trapped by the present. It's a gift for us to be able to see where God wants us to take us. As my son said this morning, I asked him why we come to church, and he started talking about bus stops. But I realized, in that retrospect, that's all this really is, is a bus stop. <laughs> we are on our way to another journey, off into eternity, and we're just taking little bus stops along the way to look at little slices of life. But the final destination is already paid for. Amen? Airbnb can't cancel your reservation. Uh, Expedia ain't got no rights on where you might be going. All of these things are covered, and we can't see it, but we have to know that it's there. Yeah. Sounds like this funny word that we use all the time. It's called faith. Yeah. That's where you can't touch or walk on it, but you just got to keep working at it anyway, right? Yeah. That's, that, that, that's the savings plan where you don't see where their retirement is going to come, but you keep putting away a few nickels every time in faith. That's the diet plan where you're like, I don't see how this is going to be a benefit to me, but I'm going to keep doing this in faith. That's where eating vegetables and water come in, right? Because I don't see the benefits of where these things are going to take me. But I know that if I keep along the way, somewhere along the lines, it's going to pay off. The thousand free throws, the, the hours of video games, the homework, the, all of these things are is just little examples of faith where you don't see the end goal, but you just keep plodding along, right? You just keep hammering away at it. We don't see what we have, but we keep moving by faith. Amen. We've got blessings in places that we don't see. Amen. Sometimes it's just nice to close your eyes and think about what those blessings might be. Amen? Don't do it too long because you still got work to do here. Now, God makes that very clear. You have an assignment. You got a function in the body. And we ought to act as if somebody, not who's grabbing resources with all we can get, but somebody who's already taken care of. You know what it's like to be taken care of? I mean, you ever walked into a place, somebody, you didn't even have to give them your name. They were like, hey, you, come on over here. I got you. Come on over here. Let me clear off the seat for you. Are you hungry? Y'all look lost like that's ain't happening. <laughs> it ain't happening to me either. I'm just imagining. But there comes a point in time where we know that we have an inheritance in a place where we will be taken care of. Now, we got work to do right when we get there. But we, we lost because we don't know what that looks like in this life. There's somebody handing us a broom and a dustpan and a mop and a bucket and, and some window wipers and cleaners and saying, get to work. One day is not going to be the case, and we have blessings in places that we cannot see. Paul wanted to make sure that he anchored them in that because he did not want them to be lost in the life of the present. And if we get lost in the present, we'll realize that there is only so much to go around, and we'll become scarce and frantic, and we'll move in a certain way. So let's set our sights on eternity. Is what Paul was after. I believe what he was after trying to offer to them at the beginning of this letter. The next thing he tells them about being in this letter is that, hey, we are God's family by adoption. And adoption is a very interesting process. Some of us have even actually adopted people in this room. We know what it's like. We've adopted people into our family as blood. We've adopted people as friends. We know what it's like to go through the process of adoption. 
adoption carries with it at least a couple of things that I'm going to point out. The first thing that adoption carries with it is a sense of value. You don't adopt outcasts. People who are outcasts, you leave on the outside. But adoption means I'm taking somebody who would normally be on the outside and I'm bringing them into my family. They have the, every right of a son that comes into place, a son or a daughter. And we know what sons or daughters have the rights to be able to do, right? Accurately, when, when we have raised a child, a son or daughter, we are hoping that we can actually leave them and what our word is, they will actually carry our word and go further on. If my son or daughter makes a promise, then I almost feel obligated to pay for it, right? Because they carry with them the name or bearing responsibility of whatever I have. Now, that's not true. Y'all can go promise whatever y'all want to. I'm not paying it. That's their responsibility to be able to do, right? But a son or daughter, you are training for the purpose of at least taking whatever few nickels you got and passing it on to them, hoping that they are going to entrust it and do more with it. It's value. It takes time to do that, right? It takes energy because you are investing in the life of someone else because you are training them and to grow in a way that you are going to raise them up to be your own family. You're taking outcasts and making them family members. That means whatever they put the seal on, you put the seal on. Now, I'm not sure in case you're wondering which two groups here we're talking about, but on the one hand, we've got a righteous God who owns everything, and on the other hand, we have a group full of sinners who don't own or have right or respect to anything. They have been disrespectful to their father in all ways, shape, form, and fashion, and deserve the very treatment of being outcast. They have actually written the word outcast on their own hearts and minds and said, we don't want to learn your ways. And by that very definition and nature, we're up to suffer the consequences of death. Adam said, in all of us, we all deserve to die. And last time I checked, all of us are going that way. And we all have our own time, and it's appointed for us to do that. But in the meantime, we have been given this opportunity to be adopted into the family of God based on the blood of Jesus Christ. So that way, when our God considers all of the riches and all of the vast wealth that he has, we are considered to have a piece of that inheritance, and that is in given to us in spiritual places, and it's also being given to us in terms of redemption. But it starts with adoption, and adoption means that we have value. If I treat everybody as if they have value, would that change my attitude? Would it, cheat it, would it change my attitude to realize that we are all on the same level in some sense? That before God, we have all been given this place or standing before God as a family member. So if I take the time to hurt my brother, who am I really hurting? It's the family that's going to hurt. The same family that I am a part of. And if you've ever had moments, in, intense moments in families, you know what it's like to be in a painful or in a hurt situation in a family. You don't want to create that, right? Some of us are struggling with hurtful situations in families right now. We know it is like trying to raise a child, and you're like, come on, can, I, can, you just, can we just work our way through this? We know the, 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 what it takes because we really have their best interests at heart because we have them and we hold them in high value. Well, we got into God's family because he valued us enough to bring us in. He adopted us into his family because we didn't deserve to be there. And based upon that standing, we now know where we are. We're worthy enough to be trained in God's presence. We are worthy enough to serve in God's body, which is the church. And we are worthy enough to carry this mission of reconciliation to the rest of the world. There's a value in us that nobody can put a place value on. There ain't enough decimals and commas in the world to put a value on each individual life that God has adopted into his family. Not only in South Berkeley, but in North Oakland, in East Oakland, in, in South America, in Europe, in Africa. The word of God is going out and everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as personal savior is adopted into the family of God. He has extended this agency to us that he is willing to accept whosoever will and we are in his family by adoption. 
I didn't earn my way into this spot, so I can't tell you where to park. I'm not putting up no signs or no markers or anything like that because we are all in God's family together. Now, there are leadership roles and there are things that happen. There are divisions in the body. Not everybody does the same thing, but the body is adopted in, and we need to praise God for the fact that we have been adopted by faith. So what we don't see is what we get. We have been adopted in a space where we cannot see it, but we also know because we have been adopted into the space, we are accepted. King James uses the word accepted. Uh, most of the other translations and the original language kind of bear more so on this idea of he freely bestowed this grace on us in the beloved. It was freely bestowed on us in the beloved. It kind of, it, it, it brings up, the only time it was really used in scripture was a time where, uh, like Pastor's favorite example of, of the woman he was talking to, and he said, I was blessed and highly favored. This is that word that, that comes up then. This is that exact same phraseology that is used in Ephesians then. So while the woman may have been wrong on that particular time, right, we all have a very special, highly favored position in God. Now, it may not be Mary's position, right? It may not be her standing, but we have a position in God that is highly favored. We do. I had the privilege of being able to watch my daughter play volleyball yesterday, and I know nothing about volleyball, so I went to watch. I know how you get points, but I didn't know, like, all the other things, the strategies and other things that's there because I'm ignorant. So I was sitting there, and the gentleman came over me, and he calls the term libero. I'm like, well, who is a libero? What is a libero? I've never heard of this position. Well, a libero is somebody who's like a defensive specialist in volleyball, right? They get the opportunity because you can only get so many substitutions in a game. The libero has a special position where they can come in and out the game without you actually having the ball because, and it doesn't count against your substitutions. Now, I might be getting that off a little bit because my volleyball logic is a little fuzzy. But what I do know about the libero is that they have a special position. Well, what about the believer? Yeah. Amen. Don't we have a special position? Are we liberals of some sort? Yes, we're not defensive specialists. Well, what are we specialists of? We ought to be the captains of grace. Yeah. No matter where we go, everybody ought to say, you know, that person is very gracious. Of all the things and all the things that we have to deal with, we ought to captain the grace of our team. Nobody's got to substitute us in. No buzzer's horn has to sound. We ought to be known by the way that we are graceful with individuals in all walks of life. Well, how do I know we should be graceful? Because God gave us grace freely. The, his grace, which was freely bestowed upon us, that is the grace that we should have, and we should carry that grace with us everywhere we go. How does that grace look like? It should show up at least in one area, which is in forgiveness. It's amazing to be able to have, go through a passage of scripture and realize how often you get stuck and walk out bleeding. But I do. When we go through scrap passages of scripture, we looked at Matthew 18, 31, 21 through 35 last week in, in, in our school. And, and just being able to go through this on a daily basis, you realize when Peter asked the question, how often shall I forgive my brother? And, and Jesus goes through this narrative about, well, 70 times 7, and, and he goes through this servant narrative uh, you come to the conclusion that the servant who stood before the king and was given forgiveness and turned around and his other friend would not give his forgiveness to his fellow servant and they both wound up in jail, the entire premise was all based on the fact that I can be able to forgive because of so much of what I have been forgiven. It sheds light on it, and the grace that shows up here ought always show up in everything that we do in this life. How much grace do I have to extend to somebody? Well, Paul put it this way in Romans. Wherever sin abounded, grace was way more than whatever your sin account was. You could run up your sin account all you want to. You will never, ever exceed the grace of God. Now, does that mean I need to go out and act a fool? No, that's not what it's saying. But he's letting you know that in perspective, the grace that God has given you, no matter all the sins that you add up in your life, you ain't going to come nowhere near exceeding that account. Your check is not going to bounce. No matter how crazy or deranged the sin is, there is more than enough grace for all that you got going on in your life. 
So if I realize that I have all of this grace, a surplus of grace in my own life, I can truly bestow this to other individuals no matter where I go. When I'm sitting in a classroom with my friends, do I need to be able to show grace? Of course I do. Is that going to be on a movie theater? No, it's not. Am I going, is it going to come up in a rap song? No, it's not. This is all based on the image of keeping Jesus Christ at the forefront of our lives and that he begins to see where we stack up in there. And when you look at Christ in the image, you're, the, where he is and where we are, all the difference that makes that up is called grace. It's no longer a debt. It's no longer wanting. Because we know there is a gap between us and Christ. Well, we ought to know. Some of us might think we're looking down on Christ the way that we live. But in all actuality, we're looking up. And all of the difference that falls in that space is called grace. And that grace, he says here to the Ephesians, has been freely bestowed upon you. Let's stop being stingy with grace, people. <laughs> it's enough of it to go around. <laughs> it's okay to say nothing and do something in love. It is okay. We don't always have to say something, right? We don't always have to be petty. We don't always have to throw that little extra line in there to make sure we bring somebody down. There is a space that is full between us and God, and it is filled with grace. I mean, we just ought to draw a line in our house every day and say, you know what, I'm not measuring up to what God wants me to be. All right, now let me go to work and live that way. <laughs> I'm not measuring up to where God wants me to be. Sweetie, how are you today? <laughs> I, I, I can talk to my children knowing that every day I live in the shadow of a line that I will never, ever amount to. Not perfection. It's always excellence. How do I try and become better every day? And we live by grace. It's freely given to us. So we want to make sure that we can't give it to others. We ought to be the captains of grace. We got our special uniform on, and it's a cross of Christ. And every day we look at that cross, we ought not to be thinking about how can I get somebody and their shortcomings and bring that to light. We ought to be thinking about how, how much of my shortcomings have I been forgiven. And if I think about how much I have been forgiven, I can go out now and work on how I can forgive somebody else and spread this gospel of forgiveness with others. All right, I think I spent too long there. Uh, but we wanted to want us to look at this position that we have in grace because it was freely bestowed upon us. What we don't see is what we get. We have blessings in places that we can't see. We have been adopted by sons, and, and as our adoption, we now have this position inside of us, which is that we are free to be captains of grace because we are the trophies of grace. We are his workmanship. Everywhere we go, the chisel and hammer should be working on our own souls to refine who we are and how we operate in this space. Well, lastly, we see here this thing that he, the, one of the things that he shares with us is that we have redemption. And this church in Ephesus, it stood clear what redemption means to them. Because they operated in an economy of slaves and servants. It's not American slavery. It's not the same thing. It was not I own you and your children and your children's children and on into perpetuity. It was a slavery of uh, economics. That was you owe me this much and you're probably going to work for me this long. They understood that concept well. Usually it was a seven-year debt or five-year debt or one-year debt and you would work your way off and once you had finished paying off your debt to your master, you would have then been called, considered yourself redeemed. They understood that term in very economical, practical terms. He was trying to get them to understand that, hey, you have a master who was sin. And he goes on in chapter 2 to explain that. And you were dead to your master in sin. But through the blood of Christ, you have been redeemed. You have the actions and the ability to be able to move as a free man or woman in Christ Jesus. You are free from sin. You do not have to live underneath the burdens of sin. You have, you don't, you're not subject to go whichever way sin goes. Because sin's got some really good flavors. 
and it changes along with every generation. Sin always looks good, don't it? I know, yeah, maybe it's just me, because I'm just, you know, but sin always looks good. Now, some of y'all have graduated from sin, and I praise God for you. The rest of us are working our way through kindergarten, still bouncing our way around the walls, trying to make sure that we don't do anything else crazy, right? When we roll out the blocks, we don't hit anybody else in the head, because we know that we're trapped in this sinful body, and this body wants certain things. But here we have been redeemed. We have the actions of freed men. We hold these truths to be self-evident, right? That all men are created equal and how flowery an arrangement that document was to declare the independence of individuals. We have been declared free from sin. So I don't have to serve my master of sin. I don't have to serve my flesh. I don't have to serve my own intentions anymore. I'm free from all of those things because I've been redeemed. One of the things that's always interesting for me now in this phase of life is, is you always look at limits and what it costs. How much does it cost? Because it may or may not be worth the value to pay for it. What I have to pay for it is not what I'm willing to do. And I've recently been doing this study on monetization because, you know, as you're working, you're growing, and nonprofits, you're learning about these things. And monetization is this very interesting process where you take something, you figure out how much somebody is willing to pay for it. And you have to have the willingness to pay conversation before you have the product conversation. That's what, this, what the guru I was listening to this week was talking about. Because you can build design the best thing in the world. If you put it on the market for $500 and people are like, ah, that's a $30 product, they're not going to buy it. Monetization says, hey, what are they willing to pay for it? What is the value that goes into it? What's interesting is that in eternity past, long before any of us were there, God decided that the value of human life was his own blood. The value of human life was his own blood. Are we going to create something? Yes. What are we going to create? Man. Okay, let's go with the program. Is he going to follow instructions? No. So once he doesn't go follow the instructions, what are we going to do? Are we going to let him wander off into eternity, or are we going to redeem him? Okay, we'll redeem him. What is the value of what we're going to use to redeem him? And this is where the story of the farmer's breakfast comes up, and you got the chicken and you got the pig, right? And the chicken and the pig say, hey, the chicken runs into the barn and says, hey, let's do farmer's breakfast. And the pig says, uh-uh, because all you got to do is give up the eggs. I got to give up the bacon. <laughs> but not comparing Jesus Christ to a pig, Jesus Christ said, I'm willing to give up my life for mankind. I'm willing to give up all that I have for mankind. So we have been redeemed with a price. Our adoption comes with a price, and we have been redeemed because God looked at all that he had. He looked at all the possessions and said that man is good enough that I am willing to redeem him with my own blood. Angels disobey, and what waits for them? There is nothing <laughs> that reserves, yeah, the chains of darkness that is set aside for them, for those who were bailed and were cast out of heaven. We have been redeemed with so great a price. Our monetization value in God's eyes is off the charts. He was willing to send his son for us. This amazing thing that we have is that we, we, we fall into this category of now we are on display. Every last believer in Jesus Christ represents the value of what God believes in each one of us. He was willing to go to the cross for us and die for each one of our sins. He holds us in very high esteem. Let's hold our ministries in high esteem. Let's hold our families in high esteem. Let's hold our friends in high esteem. Let's hold our school and community members in high esteem. Because everywhere we go on display is us and God's grace. You ever pass by a window dressing before they actually get it up? You don't want to walk in that department store. I'm like, I don't feel like walking in there. 
they're putting stuff up. You see people shuffling with boxes, and usually they do it before you get to the mall, right? They do it in the morning, and they take it down and all those things. Why? Because when you walk in there, you were able to see, like, oh, that coat looks nice. My Marshall's coat looks good, huh, Leonard? Right? And it does. It looks, oh, that, that's a place I want to go in and shop. I want to buy something. I want to spend some money there. Right? You're excited about it because they put it on display. How do you think we're going to get folks to fall in love with Christ? What do we put on display? What do we send out? How do we communicate with individuals and text messages and emails and, and, and letters that we write and come across and, and in all of these various places where God has graced us to go, right? Everywhere we go, we get the opportunity to put God's grace on display. When the restaurant service is slow, <laughs> when the PG&E bill doubles, when kids ain't following instructions, wife ain't listening, husband ain't listening, when I just want to do what I want and I want it the way that I want it and it's not coming the way that I want it, I got to put God's grace. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, don't, it don't always look good, right? But I got to put God's grace on display. Just a simple service reminder. We're in God's family, not by race, but by grace. It is a precious position to be in in God's family. And Paul wanted to remind them of this precious position of the wealth that they had in Ephesus and the wealth that still falls out to us in the church. We've got an inheritance. I think it's all building on this idea of family because the church isn't an institution where people take classes and fail classes. It's a family whereby which we grow together and we grow closer to God. He painted that picture for them early so that they will fall in line and understand that by grace they are saved. They understand what it means to be his workmanship. And when you operate from a position of wealth, you will understand how to walk worthy of this vocation that you have been given. Yeah. You've been given sonship. You can't act like hirelings. We can't act like servants, and, and we can't act like that we don't know what's going on. We have a position of sonship before God. And we enter this position by grace. Amen? Amen? All right. I can honestly say God has slapped me around enough. And that's enough of the beating that I'm going to pass along to you all. I don't consider myself a doctor walking around a room of patients. I consider myself in bed four in room 314. <laughs> we are right along us, and we're all tied to the very same IV, which is the word of God. And through prayer and supplication, we have his Holy Spirit to give us guiding light and instruction. Along this bus stop journey, hopefully we have incurred some things that can help us understand that we have a special position in the family of God. Our position is anchored, and it is sealed by the Holy Spirit. I praise God it is. It's not tied to any markets or indices. And we have a value, a monetization value, in Christ Jesus, which was given to us by his blood. Spread that grace around. Never miss an opportunity to spread a moment of grace. Never miss an opportunity to share with you how graceful or how joyous or how outright you can be. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. I love them just as you do. But it's grace that saved us, right? And it's grace that's going to get folks to take on. And as the songwriter said, and I'll leave you with that, it is your grace and mercy that brought us through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy has brought me through. Amen. Amen. For those of you who may not know who our Savior is, I pray that you will come to know him. 
feel free to reach out to us online. Feel free. There are individuals in this room who may not know. But as I span the room, I see family. I see people who've known and who've walked with God a long time. And our challenge is really to figure out how do we take this grace and apply it? And how do we live it out in such a way where other people are like, I want what you got. <laughs> how do we do that, right? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Holy Father, thank you once again for giving us this letter to the Ephesians. Thank you for Paul who decided to pass on your love from prison to the church in Ephesus. Individuals whom he had lived with and been with for a while. But there were just a few things that he wanted to cover. And we're grateful some 2,000 years later for the things that you have covered. We praise God to know that we got into the family by adoption. So now us and Israel are in the perfect standing with you. Gentiles don't lack behind Jews in any way, shape, form, or fashion in the economy of God. We are in your family by adoption, and we are trained by you as sons so that we can carry on your work in the body. Help us to live by grace. Help us to learn more and more and more about grace and improve in it every day. Just like knowing that in every other skill in life, we will never perfect it, but we have to work on growing and improving it. Help us as we continue our study in Ephesians during the Sunday school and as we continue on in our lives, wherever we go, help us to carry that sound of grace with you. The space between where you are and where we are is filled with grace. And help us to pass out that grace to as many people as we can because we know you love us. Help us to pass that love on to others. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I'll leave you with the words of Paul as he left with the Ephesians. Uh, oops, where'd he go? Where'd he put that at? He had one in the middle. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Ephesians chapter 3. I'll leave you with the same benediction that he left with them, which is now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him, Christ, our Savior, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And the church can do nothing but say amen. amen.